Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Association for Baha'i Studies Annual Conference. Over the next hour, it's my pleasure to host you for the presentation, Developing an Approach to Discourse. Over the next hour, we will hear from four members of the U.S. Baha'i Office of Public Affairs and, learn, and we will learn about what they have been uh, learning in um, their work in the area of discourse. Over the last five years, the Office of Public Affairs with the Baha'is of the United States has been reorient reorienting its focus, moving beyond peer representation of the Baha'i community in national spaces, OPA has been learning about what it means to contribute to prominent national discourses, including race, media, sustainable development, economic inequality, and human rights. This shift in focus has also reorganized to some degree the OPA self-conception from an entity that articulates a Baha'i perspective in national spaces to one that builds collaborations among like-minded people and organizations, developing a common vision on how to advance society. So today, uh, four members from the office have prepared a presentation, which will really be a conversation based around different questions that they're learning about. And we invite the audience after about 40 minutes uh, to pose their questions. You can actually enter them in the chat box under this video as the presentation is ongoing, but we will leave uh, room at the end for discussion. And now I would invite May to please uh, introduce yourself and the other members in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for that wonderful introduction. Um, my name is May Lample, and I'm a race discourse officer with the US Baha'i Office of Public Affairs. Um, I'll be starting us off today um, by giving a little bit of an introduction to our work, um, and then we'll have a chance to hear from some of our other panelists, and I'll be posing some questions to them uh, for them to share their experience based on um, based on their work, the work and the work of our office. Um, so our office is an agency of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, and we're tasked with representing the American Baha'i community at the national level. And our office is learning about contributing to the discourses of society that have a significant bearing on the well being of the country through applying Baha'i principles and accumulated experience applying those principles. So, Andrea mentioned some of the discourse, some of the areas of discourse that our office focuses on, and I'll just repeat them. So, we, we focus on the environment, the equality of women and men, economic justice, racial justice and unity, media, and human rights. And the last three will really be the focus of our conversation today as the discourse officers representing those areas are here today on the panel. So our work at the level of discourse is really guided by the idea that the challenges that we're witnessing humanity undergo can't be solved without the illumination of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. And we know that the type of change we're envisioning will not come about solely through the efforts of the Baha'i community but will be the result of all individuals and groups contributing to the advancement of civilization. And we're working alongside others who are deeply engaged in pursuing new knowledge, social progress and transformation. The work that we're doing now is part of a process that can be seen as a first step that will take decades, perhaps even centuries to unfold. And as part of our work, we try to read different aspects of social reality from a Baha'i perspective build relationships with the diversity of individuals and organizations, attend a variety of social spaces where conversations on these subjects are taking place, as well as create our own spaces and develop content that can be used to further these conversations. And although we focus on differing discourse areas, we often address foundational elements that cut across any one specific area talk about elements of human nature, the nature of change, the kind of social transformation we're trying to build, these key elements that are part of our conceptual framework for action. We talk about human beings as being both spiritual and material, capable of great feats of generosity, self-sacrifice, and growth. We discuss the importance of change through cooperation and reciprocity, 
in which our means are in line with our ends, in which individual community and institutions recognize their roles in social transformation and seeks to support each other in the process of change. We talk about the need for transformation at the level of individual and at the level of institutions, and that these two types of transformations have to happen simultaneously. We talk about unity and justice as two foundational principles for a new world order that need to operate both as end goals and as operating principles. And we talk about how learn, we talk about learning as a mode of operation in which all assume a posture of humility. And these represent just a few of the elements of our framework that we try to bring into our work at the level of discourse. And our panel will share, um, share more about this uh, in their presentations. Um, the guidance given to us by the Universal House of Justice in its July 22nd message is extremely relevant to the work carried out by our office in which they stated, within the context of the framework governing your activities, it is necessary to carefully examine the forces unfolding around you to determine where your energies might reinforce the most promising initiatives, what you should avoid and how you might lend a distinctive contribution. It is not possible for you to affect the transformation envisioned by Baha'u'llah merely by adopting the perspectives, practices, concepts, criticism, and language of a contemporary society. Your approach instead will be distinguished by maintaining a humble posture of learning, weighing alternatives in light of his teachings, consulting to harmonize differing views and shape collective action, and marching forward with unbreakable unity in serried lines. So now I wanna invite my colleagues into this conversation where they'll introduce themselves uh, and start with giving a brief introduction to their work. Hi everyone, Alaupa, I hope you're all doing well. My name is James Samimi Farr and I'm the media officer for the US Baha'i Office of Public Affairs. And uh, I think it's apt in a certain way that we started uh, with, with my introduction because I think my role uh, changed a lot when uh, when I first joined the office in 2017, it was right around the time that our office was uh, experiencing a bit of a transition as far as how we approach the work. So when I interviewed for this position and when I, when I read about the description and was told about the job, um, in many ways it was described chiefly as a, as a communications position. So my job would be to place press releases concerning the persecution of the Baha'is of Iran and Yemen, pitch stories to journalists, on, uh, on these issues of persecution and essentially uh, try to have stories about the persecution of our community in, in the national media. However, when, uh, when I joined the office, it became clear that this, this role was actually a lot more broad um, and the way that the House of Justice and, and some of the House of Justice's offices and agencies were encouraging us to think about this role was a lot more broad as well. So um, there was some guidance or some, some advice really that was issued stating that while it would be important to learn about the techniques of, uh, of communications, what would be far more profound would be to enter into an evolving conversation with media professionals and practitioners about the role of media in society. So my, uh, my work in a sense overnight kind of got flipped into this, uh, into this discursive mode of, of functioning in which I really had to think, okay, what, what is the role of media in society? How do I even begin to approach this question? And so that's really what I've been thinking about for the last three years and trying to understand it. And my work has involved um, a number of different things, you know, building relationships with different collaborators, which chiefly means journalists and media academics, people who think about it on a regular basis. And uh, actually right now I'm trying to uh, develop some spaces where, where I host a number of journalists in an ongoing conversation about the role of media in society. And we discuss a number of different themes, uh, including but not limited to the limits and politics of objectivity, the 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 uh, the importance of narrative, um, different questions like this, disinformation, um, issues that are prominent in media discourse and where there is an opportunity to correlate aspects of the Baha'i teachings to these questions. And I think I'll leave it there for now because I don't want to take too much time in my intro. Uh, thank you very much, James. Hi, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, my name is Tashika McBean, and I'm the Human Rights Officer for the U.S. Baha'i Office of Public Affairs. 
I work primarily on issues related to the defense of the Baha'is in Iran and Yemen. But in addition, I explore emerging discourses related to human rights and areas that intersect with the other discourses in the office, as May outlined a few moments ago, such as the role of religion in advancing gender equality and conceptions of justice in the United States. Um, before I joined the office, I came with a background in international law and domestic law, specifically human rights, child abuse and maltreatment, family law, criminal law. And so having this background and thinking how to engage in discourse was very, um, was very interesting in that the conversation, the emerging conversation and justice um, connects with my past, but also it's uh, emerging discourses discourse right now in the United States. Um, in the past, I worked as a defense attorney for formerly incarcerated individuals, where my main role was to remove barriers to employment, housing, and successfully reintegrate these individuals back into society. And through my experience working in this field, I found that the US criminal justice system had um, some oppressive elements. And it also seemed that the structure of our justice system effectively alienated people who, had, um, who were convicted of crime. So four years ago, March 2016, the conversation regarding justice or criminal justice reform were mostly um, tailored or tied to um, policy initiatives, changing laws, passing legislation. But right now in this current atmosphere, the conversation about criminal justice reform is at the national level. And it seems like, you know, groups, regardless of political affiliation, social groups, religious affiliations, all agree to some extent that, you know, the criminal justice system needs some level of reform. And coincidentally, there are also emerging narratives about radical changes that is necessary for this criminal justice reform. And uniquely, these changes seem to invite dialogue and conversation that are centered on certain spiritual themes like cooperation, accountability, forgiveness, et cetera. And surveying this area, this specific new emerging line of thought regarding underlying foundational elements, I found that there are certain areas that the teachings of Baha'u'llah can actually illumine this conversation. And as May said, there's, you know, throughout our framework, there's, there, there are certain themes that cut across all the discourse areas, you know, the nobility of humankind. And with regards to justice, the teachings of Baha'u'llah is vast, it's filled with insight. And it begs us to think about how do we create a new framework of justice, especially since, you know, there are certain elements um, in a national discourse that lends itself to these spiritual underlying principles. Um, so I'll stop here and we'll continue the conversation. Thanks. Hi, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. My name is PJ Andrews, um, and I also serve as a, alongside May as a race discourse officer for the Office of Public Affairs. Um, and our work has um, we've been we've been we came on at the end of 2017, um, and a lot of our work initially um, was really learning. Um, how to develop certain certain capacities uh, that that were were sort of critical to be able to contribute to discourse at the national level, and one of those was really being able to have a thorough reading of the discourse on race in America. So we we actually took some time to map it. We took some time, and it, of course, it's an evolving exercise. But we we did a lot of work just trying to identify what are the major themes in the discourse on race. What are the sub themes within those major themes? What are the who are the major thinkers who are advancing the discourse um, most prominently and, and loudly, but also who are maybe making some of the most some really interesting contributions much more quietly and under the radar? We're trying to really catch the full breadth of that landscape. Um, and of course, we can't we couldn't do that completely, but it was a really helpful exercise for us to understand to understand it better and see where where we might be able to start applying some principles from the revelation of Baha'u'llah in a meaningful way. And I think early on in our, our, our discourse, in our, in our exploration, we, we noticed that there was um, maybe a, a, a tension between the relationship between justice and unity in the national discourse on race. 
um, that sometimes they, they felt like they were pitted against each other and also that, that understandings of them were quite limited and, and maybe dominated by a materialistic vision of the two, of justice and of unity. Um, and so we thought that, in fact, the faith has incredible things, incredible depth to, to offer to a, a discourse on justice and unity. Um, and and we, were, we were guided very early on by a statement of Baha'u'llah where he says, um, the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. So, so that statement, um, and if you've seen us present in other spaces, you might have, have heard this, but it's, been a, it's sort of been a guiding light for us in terms of, of, of how, we, how we really think about the relationship between these two, these two cardinal principles. Um, but of course, they're so huge. There's, they're, it's really hard to approach those, um, the, the relationship between justice and unity in such an abstract way. Um, and so it, it's, um, we found a, a, one, a few discourses that have allowed us uh, within the, discourse, the broader discourse on race that have allowed us to explore that a little more, more deeply. So one is, um, uh, is related to uh, conceptions of history. Um, and, and embedded in the discourse on truth and reconciliation. Um, there, a lot of work has been done uh, globally around truth and reconciliation to repair from, from basically human atrocities. Um, but there's been very little, although some meaningful work around truth and reconciliation in, in terms of the history of race in America. But it's a growing field. And in fact, since the, the killing of George Floyd, it's, it's actually taken on an, an incredible legs. But we've been following this discourse for a number of years. And, and, and I think, in, in a sense, um, history is an expression of, of truth. Understanding the, the history of what has happened is, is an expression of truth. Um, and then reconciliation, in a sense, is an expression of, of unity. But there is a bridge between um, truth and reconciliation, and that is, is, is repair. And the idea from that there needs to be some effort to repair from harm done, from, from the, the history, of, history of harm done. So a lot of our, our work has been that working with groups of people who, are, who fall in the, the world of developing historical narratives around race that help us understand who we are and help us then move forward. So, so that's one area. We've also been working in the area of, of expanded conceptions of justice that Tashika was touching on, but um, restorative justice, reparative justice, healing justice, um, to name a few that help us transform or transformative justice that help us transform into something um, new and different. Um, and so then to be able to begin a conversation on, on reconciliation as an expression of unity. Um, and then two other areas that we've, we've been keenly interested in is, is what we call, sort of talk about becoming champions of justice. What does it look like for everyone to um, contribute to, to this process of, of racial healing and transformation? Um, and recognizing that we all have different um, roles and responsibilities to play depending on our social position in society. So we've been exploring in, uh, with, with different groups and organizations um, what it looks like for all to be able to um, contribute to transformative processes of racial healing. Um, and, then, and then that, find, that sort of leads to and, and connects very closely to um, another theme, which is that of participation. Um, so, so I think the uh, participation actually in, in, in 2010 in the, the 28 December 2010 message, uh, or it might have been the Resvan 2010, but the House of Justice says um, justice demands universal participation. So, so this idea that in the process of, of transformative um, work, that everyone needs to contribute. There really isn't any sidelines. So what does it look like to create um, the conditions in society for all to be able to find their, their role and to contribute collaboratively um, to a process of transformative social change around, um, around racial justice and unity? So I'll, those are a few of the, the broad themes that we explore. There, there are others, but um, I think as we get into the questions of this panel, we'll, we'll be able to, to maybe give some concrete examples. Thank you. Um, I was hoping you guys could talk about why we contribute at the level of thought and what we hope to see through these contributions. Yeah, maybe continuing the trend, I'll uh, offer some 
brief initial reflections. You know, I think this is this is a question that we often pose within ourselves. And as Baha'is, you know, I think it's something that we often think about because we're such an active community. You know, we're so used to getting out and trying to do stuff and, and putting all this emphasis on, you know, getting out there and, and, and contributing something to, to social change and to social progress that when we talk about something at the level of thought, it's a little bit, um, there can be a certain wariness around it. You know, and one, one idea and one quote that I find supremely helpful in that regard is I, I always think back to this remark from Abdu'l-Bahá in Paris Talks where he, uh, he said that the reality of man is his thought. And for me, this just has such profound implications. Um, and we know, you know, in later on in that very same passage, he goes on to say, Abdu'l-Bahá goes on to say that thought is useless without action, you know, but, but implied in his statement, I think, is that meaningful action cannot occur without sound developed thinking behind it. Um, because after all, human beings are not automatons. The, the way that we move through life, the way that we seek to create social change and contribute to you know, the prosperity of our society, both spiritual and material, uh, these contributions are, are propelled by sets of ideas that shape our actions. And with respect to my own discourse area, you know, there's another quote from Abdu'l-Bahá that I often return to a lot, and it's that he writes, the publication of high thoughts is the dynamic power in the arteries of life. It is the very soul of the world. So clearly there's something very important there for us to consider as Baha'is, I think, you know? And, and uh, for me, being engaged in immediate discourse is, is particularly interesting and almost a little bit um, meta in a certain way. Uh, because I think, you know, media and our media systems, they're one of the preeminent spaces in which thought itself becomes public. Um, media systems are places where thoughts themselves are mediated to the public. They're shaped and explored and, and understood. And there's a sense of trying to create, you know, a public mind in a way through our media systems. And, you know, there's relative degrees of success and failure and all of that. But nevertheless, I think it's sort of a, an important point to consider when you're thinking about, about media generally. Um, and I would say also, you know, journalism as an industry, it's, it's somewhat already predisposed to, to self-reflection. There are a lot of, you know, different think pieces, different ideas floating around about what the nature of journalism is and, and how it should be. But these are often limited to a very specific and discrete band of ideas. So I think in my uh, focus area, in, in the role of media and society, I often think about how to evolve media to, to realize its, its role more, the, the role that Abdu'l-Bahá describes as, as the publication of high thoughts being the very soul of the world. And for me, this, this comprises a couple of different things. Um, I think media should be a place where we, we come to understand uh, the forces and processes shaping shaping our society and our world, and then also uh, enable the diffusion, enable the the distribution of of ideas that are that are contributing to the transformation of society and, and its movement toward uh, the lesser peace, you might call it, toward a unified and just civilization. And I think we have a sense often in, in media discourse of uh, of this first point of trying to understand the world around us, maybe in, in a certain way, um, though many might call that into question itself. But the second point, I think, of, uh, of diffusing kind of helpful ideas and, and, uh, and examples that are, that are occurring across the world to address uh, social change and social ideas, I, I don't think that's explored quite enough in, in, the, in the conversation that I've observed on the national level. You know, tr mainstream or traditional media can be somewhat agnostic, I think, towards social change. Um, so I think that's really what I'm, what I'm hoping to do through this contribution of the level of thought is really sort of reshape the thinking and framework behind how we think about media and, and move it toward more of a vision of what's, of what's described in the writings. You know, Baha'u'llah memorably described uh, media as a, or really newspapers as a mirror of the world. And this is a, a short aphorism, but it contains so many uh, you know, beautiful resonances and implications and so I think through, through our work, we're, we're trying to sort of tease that out, those implications, and rebuild a, a new framework through which to address these things. Okay. Uh, thank you, James. I think that um, to address this question, you know, great thinkers of all, throughout history have always harnessed the, you know, 
harness the, the idea that thoughts are important. Um, Albert Einstein said that, and that's a quote that, you know, underlines some of my thinking as well. He said that, you know, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. And obviously this makes sense. Otherwise, we just create the same, different manifestations of the same problem by the old way of thinking. You know, nothing is solved, the issue is stagnated. But when we engage in genuine conversations at the level of thought, you know, we, we draw from our experiences, our education, culture, science. And now in, in terms of thinking of adding religion to the list of insights that you draw from when contributing to the level of thought, create something new and different. And I think with the introduction of religion as a, a, a source of insight, it, 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 it lends itself to you know, create and shape something new. Um, you know, as, and I've been in the office for the past two years, and it's clear that religion as a body of knowledge is vast and affords us the opportunity to add, you know, new insights, you know, create new narratives or, or, or new or complete narratives. And, you know, if you think about, you know, why do we focus on the level of thought? And if, you know, thought influences speech, emotions, actions, and to me, so to me, it makes sense that when you engage in a level of thought, you also influence these other areas, as James outlined a few, few moments ago. Um, but considering um, the emerging conversation on justice and what my plans are, I just plan to continue to engage in as many spaces as possible and freely share insights from the writings of Baha'u'llah and be attentive to how you know, various groups are interacting with these concepts. When I first started looking at this conversation on justice, and especially with my background as a defense attorney, um, I'm trying to find some hope, <laughs> hope in the oppression. Um, uh, Baha'u'llah's quote about justice, which says, and I'm gonna read this, um, the light of man is justice, quench it not with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny. So it follows that, any system that is oppressive cannot be just. And considering my prior work and this quote, it, it, it allowed me to think, how do we then create systems of justice that do not lead to oppression? And when I engage with you know, fellow attorneys or activists on this particular concept, it's a very unique and refreshing thought that lends itself to very holistic conversations. And in doing so, thinking about a system that doesn't lead to oppression, you also think about what is the role of the community, the institutions and the individual in achieving this particular mandate? And then, you know, how do we create a justice system whereby the end results are coherent with the means of administering justice? And as you, as you, as you poke and prod at these thoughts, new ideas and conversations would emerge. For example, how do we even begin to imagine a system where punishment would not lead to further oppression of the community, uh, perpetual punishment of the perpetrators that, you know, what I saw in my prior job, or a state of affairs where the victims are not truly recompensed, which, you know, PJ alluded to in terms of restorative justice, and also institutions that are not burdened and corrupt and in that the lack of transparency, among other things, causes public distrust. Um, and so such, such ideas and a new thought lends itself to holistic conversation. Even, you know, maybe like two days ago, um, I came across this Baha'i-inspired text about consultation. And a part of the, the text read that getting to a just solution may create a new problem, which is worse than the original one. And that had me thinking, if we, if we delve more into this particular line and we, and, we, and we think about how do we then create or a new understanding of the criminal justice system, especially punishment. And it had me thinking, it, it made me harken back to my prior job. And the question that I, that, that I was kind of going over with this particular line, how do we, Get to a just solution may create a new problem, which is worse than the original one. I think about a, a scenario whereby a father, you know, kills someone, and he is given a life sentence. 
but he leaves behind five children in foster care. So it's a just action according to how our society, our society is currently structured. Does it create a worse problem? And if so, how do we then create something new, et cetera? And you know, ideas or, or thoughts around in the one is of humanity and shifting you know, conversations from what is just for me to what is just for us or what is just for the community also lends itself to like new questions and new thought. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna leave it there and we'll pick it up in the other questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just add a, 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 a few other thoughts about this. Um, and maybe as I do so, I can, I can also start to address our second question, which is um, why is building relationships important when it comes to contributing at the level of thought? And so just thinking about um, the, what my colleagues have shared about why it's important to work at the level of thought and its connection to relationships. Um, so one thing that, that I, was, I was thinking about is, is how um, there's sort of this intimate connection between language and consciousness. And so um, as, as your consciousness advances, so does, does your language and then language as Tashiko was saying influences action. So there's these, these, all, these things all, all are connected, very intimately connected. And so, um, you know, we, we talk a lot in the faith about having a conceptual framework for action. And a conceptual framework is a, is a tool by which um, there are certain beliefs, principles, convictions, um, assumptions about human nature and reality that guide your that guide your thinking in the way that you act. Um, and I think one of the, the greatest powers of a, of a society that we that we currently have that's quite oppressive is that people aren't really um, given the, the aren't really the capacity isn't developed to be able to connect their their beliefs, their thoughts, their actions, their conceptual framework to the things that they do. So then what ends up happening is there's sort of um, inconsistency between means and ends, right? So your principles and your beliefs aren't always aligned with your actions, but when you're able to articulate, well, these are the things that I believe and this is, and then this is the way that I act as, as a result of my convictions, it's quite empowering. Um, and so I think, you know, a, a lot of what we do in, in, in our work is try and um, really think about how we can unearth some of the hidden assumptions that, that underpin, you know, the social order of American society. Um, and, and not to say that they're all good or bad, just to be able to actually lay them out on the table and then say, well, okay, well, if this is the way that our society, these are the beliefs, convictions that our society is currently structured under um, or around what needs to go and what needs to stay and what needs to evolve. And so then, um, you know, just to give an example. So one assumption that I think is exist you know exists in our society um, is that um, uh, change happens through conflict, and that um, that generally we are we 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 advance through competition, um, and so then that has a lot of uh, of impact on the way that we even we even think about um, the way the way that progress can occur, and so you know in our in the Baha'i perspective we might say that change actually happens through collaboration and reciprocity. So then you're kind of thinking, well, how can how can you um, advance thinking that enables language to evolve around a co you know collaborative action and, and reciprocity? And so then just to connect it to this question of relationships um, and how conceptual frameworks um, maybe get brought forth. So there's a a, a, a friend and, and colleague that we have that 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 May and I have been been working with for about a year and a half now, um, and he was recently. Um, developing a, a series of talks with, with four organizations uh, in, in Washington, DC, and they're all basically national organizations based here. And he was talking about some of the, the difficulties that he was having um, that each of the organizations came with certain um, need, institutional needs. And he was trying to navigate those institutional needs. And, and I was, because of my, my close relationship with him, I, you know, he, I was able to sort of present the idea of well, what would it look like to have um, a process of, of learning among these four organizations where you don't see yourselves as um, trying to compromise around certain institutional priorities, but actually trying to find over the course of the series of presentations that you're contributing together to um, 
a sort of unity of thought, a deeper level of, of unity of thought that might actually um, bring you closer together and help you rise above what you see as things that keep you separate, that, that um, are, are sort of barriers between your two organizations, you, these four organizations. So anyway, so I just wanted to sort of connect the dots of how um, my ability, the ability of having an evolving relationship um, in this particular co context allowed me to sort of um, help help my friend think about some of the um, assumptions that were underpinning his decision making process and maybe bring in some um, different principles that were illumined by the revelation and some of the work that May and I are doing um, to think about how he, he is creating social spaces that advance thinking. Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that, PJ. I think... Uh... You know, it's all, it also works, it works both ways in a certain sense too, that, you know, as, as Baha'is, we were equipped with a very general sense of the revelation and its implications. But of course, we would never believe that, uh, you know, we had it all figured out and elaborated, you know, and, and I often like to think of uh, the life of an idea in a certain sense as like building a snowman. And here I'm really betraying my Canadian uh, roots here, but you know, when you're building a snowman, uh, you know, think of it like the initial momentum that's propelled. I like to think of like the force of the revelation, you know, and maybe that first little like snowball that we're rolling is, is, is us, you know, kind of contributing our understanding of it. But as it rolls and it develops heft and becomes a more defined object, you know, it really, it really depends on the contributions of others. Those other little bits of snow, they get picked up in it. And then it, that's how it truly develops into something, you know, substantial. So I think we really need a process of collective inquiry that involves all the members of society to help elaborate and elucidate you know some, some of the principles with which with which we're equipped you know and they kind of lend to a a much more holistic understanding of, of these principles you know and I, I think that's that's a big part of it as well and just to add to that i think that relationships just allows that space for deep um holistic conversations. I don't think that you will go deep if, if you don't have a trust and relationship with someone else. I think building relationship, and I, I mentioned that um, in thinking of, you know, the, the, the bodies of knowledge that we glean insights from, if, if, if you want to glean insights from religious texts, then I think having a relationship allows that to naturally um, come in, in into a conversation. And um, I just want to add that. Um, May, do you have any thoughts on this? particular question? Well, I was just going to say something that we found of benefit is that, I mean, and I think it's also something that we're also seeing through the Institute process. So it's not surprising that it also is relevant to us in a participation discourse, but the strength of, a, of building relationships with people allows you to go more into depth around particular ideas and to explore concepts. I mean, what PJ was saying around the idea that part of our contribution to discourse is really thinking about what are the underlying assumptions that underpin our actions and our beliefs. Um, we don't have a lot of space to actually do that in society. Think about why do we believe what we actually believe. Um, so that's one of the things that we try to do in the spaces that we create. And we mentioned specifically to, to our friends and collaborators from wider society who, part, who join us in our spaces that this is really an opportunity for us to step back from our day-to-day -day obligations um, and to think about uh, why we're doing what we're doing essentially. And I think that we've also found, especially in our particular discourse area, um, PJ and I, that the quality of the relationships we have with the people that we're working with allow us to have a type of trust and a type that allows for a depth of conversation that we wouldn't otherwise have. Also, not everything we necessarily believe is Baha'is around the elimination of racism is, is popular, is something that everyone believes is easily digestible in a matter of a few talking points. But when we have relationships with people, it allows us to offer those thoughts humbly and to explore them. And people are receptive to those ideas because they trust us and know that we're coming from a particular um coming from a, pl a sincere place of wanting to see the elimination of racism. I mean, if you think about the idea that we essentially, as Baha'is, or my understanding is that we're also in the, that we are, we have an understanding of identity that exists beyond just a racial identity, our spiritual identity, um, and this underlying oneness of humanity. That's not 
as, as though, there, though there's a growing understanding of that, I think there are also, it's popular um, in, our, in our society to, to want to really hold, hold on tightly to certain racial identities because we conflate or strongly associate race and culture um, which has, I mean, that's another topic, which has elements of validity. But I think that people are willing to understand why it is we might want to move beyond a racial identity um, when they understand that what we're looking for is an elimination of racism and one that actually appreciates the diversity and experiences that people have had. Um, so that's just to give one example. But I know that we also want to allow time for questions. Um, so I'm not sure if Andrea, if you wanted to pose a few questions to us on that, we'll, we'll be happy to respond. Sure. Thank you so much for this very rich conversation. And the first question, I think, uh, would build on what you were just talking about, May, uh, which is this trust and this ongoing dialogue you have with collaborators in different areas of discourse. So the question is, have you found agreement or a like-minded response from those that you engage with um, in areas relating to the conceptual framework, elements and principles in each area of discourse? Yeah, this is a really interesting question and actually um, a pretty uh, active area of learning for us is, is to, to, to try and gauge how people respond to the introduction of Baha'i ideas. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting. We, so, so we host, our office hosts a quarterly dialogue on faith and race that brings together national faith-based organizations um, to explore the question, the, the overarching question, what is the role of religion in the elimination of racism? Recognizing um, that religion has had, um, has been an incredible force to sustain racist thinking and patterns but also has, is an incredible force to transcend um, and is, is the path to sort of um, true identity, right? So, so then how do we explore this, this, this complex history of religion and race? And so, so this is the purpose of the space that we create. And it's a pretty consistent space. There's about 50 people or so come on a somewhat regular basis. There's usually about 25 people each time. And, um, and I, I think, you know, we've been able to create the discussion papers that guide that space that are that allows us the opportunity to introduce Baha'i ideas um, to relevant topics of the, on the discourse on to the discourse on race. Um, and, and because of its coherence, we have been able to sort of track a little bit the evolution of, of thought within the participants over time. But I, I think it's really more at this at this point, still in in one on one relationships, so it's in those um, in between the sessions we we really do to we're very intentional about sort of visiting all of the participants as much as possible, um, in person or over Zoom phone calls, just to kind of check in with them and continue the conversation and and, and find other avenues of of collaboration. And I think it's in those sort of smaller settings, those more intimate conversations that we we have recognized, you know. Um, people's um, thinking changing. But I, I also think that, you know, the evolution of what's happening in this country also affects people. So whatever is unfolding in the country at that time, you know, so like one participant was feeling particularly hopeless <laughs> at one point, and then the next dialogue, she came back and was res the, the sort of ideas that tended towards hope were resonating much more with that participant. So I think it's also about having a faithful presence in a space that that sort of presents certain ideas in a certain posture over time that can also influence people's thinking um, cumulatively. Yeah, I would say, you know, like mindedness is, is a continuum like any other, you know, and sometimes it, it simply starts with a spark of reciprocity, but it can often develop relatively quickly into something rather exciting. And I think, um, you know, when I first started trying to enter into media spaces and have conversations about the role of media in society, I certainly had a lot of trepidation representing myself as a Baha'i in these spaces. Uh, because I think to many people, the connection wouldn't necessarily be clear. You know, why does, why does a Baha'i care about the role of media in society? What are you, what are you really about here? And that sort of thing. But there, there's one example of like-mindedness that I think is really um, interesting and exciting that I'd like to just briefly touch on. And that was, um, so some years ago, there was uh, 
there was a communications professional journalist who was, who was uh, contracted by the Baha'i National Center in the U.S. to help out with some communications work. And during her time uh, with the Baha'is in the United States, she became very inspired by our principles of consultation, our uh, principles of accompanying others. And she actually started uh, a journalism movement based on this, uh, which is, and, or, you know, she might not say that she started it. Her name is Jennifer Brandell, and she has an organization called Harkin, which has really uh, just kickstarted this whole wave of engagement journalism. So thinking more intimately about the role of a journalist and, uh, and their relationship with their audience. So she's been doing wonderful things with this organization, and, and she specifically um, cites the principles of the faith as being one source of inspiration for her work. Fast forward a couple of years, um, she learned, Jennifer learned that there was another journalist for The Atlantic, a writer of, of books, her name is Amanda Ripley, uh, who was working on a book on how to transcend conflict and polarization. And Jennifer, through her experience with the Baha'i faith, said, oh, Amanda, you should really talk to some, some Baha'is, you know? And so Jennifer was connected to a Baha'i who then connected uh, her to our office. And we actually had an, an interview that's, that's going to be forthcoming in her book uh, about, about this, that kind of describes the Baha'i approach to consultation, the Baha'i approach to elections and these kind of things. And we just had such a wonderful conversation that she actually joined my own uh, regular media roundtable conversation. So now we're in regular conversation with each other and, and, and trying to develop some ideas together. And it was just this beautiful sort of... Uh, many threaded, you know, relationship of reciprocity through one person who'd been connected to the Baha'is, you know, then found an, you know, connected another person to the Baha'is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a modest, it's a modest thing at this stage, but there's, there's so much potential in it, I think. And I think I could also add that because, you know, I'm in, I'm engaged in these immersion conversations. So I go around different spaces and see what um, people are talking about, see if there's any um, spiritual insights or conversation happening. And on these one-on-one -on -one conversation that PJ was talking about, when I mentioned, for example, that, you know, justice shouldn't be oppressive. If a system is oppressive, that means it's not just. And that you can see the spark and the expression of people receiving that information. And I think just, 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 just we, we know that there's this, the animating force of Baha'u'llah's revelation touches everybody. So when you mention a phrase or a quote that, um, resonates with people. I think the, to gauge that response, you see, you know, the way in which people follow up with you or send articles or, you know, to Shiki, you, this might be interesting to your work and, 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 and keep those relationships building. So I think that, you know, you know, join as much from the teaching of Baha'u'llah because that is the bridge that connects so many people on um, these emerging issues and just um, gauge in their receptiveness or the way, you know, the lights, the eyes would light up, uh, just, just listen to a phrase or a new concept and, and seeing the way in which they engage with that concept. I think at, at this initial stage, that is the, the way in which I'm gauging the like-mindedness and the follow-up conversations and the follow-up emails or the tweets or you know, something of that nature. So, thank you. I wanted to talk about this question too, because I think we have like, I don't, I, maybe I shouldn't speak for everyone, but for myself, like an evolving idea of what like-minded means. <laughs> Whereas initially, I think when we, I first started the job, like-minded really meant people who, who you can, who from a very basic foundation, we understand things in a similar way. So like, okay, there are also people who are seeking um, to eliminate just uh, racism and, um, maybe are following similar methods but i think that the law that i've also come to appreciate more and more that one of our roles as baha'is is to create um to higher and higher levels of unity so that even if our methodology is 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 different um how can we reach out to or be in conversation with organizations that have similar end goals and i think that one of the things we've also been thinking about is how do we engage people in a conversation like differing organizations that are seemingly not actually in conversation with each other or who perhaps approach things from a different different way. I mean, I don't wanna talk too much about this example because it's not my specific discourse area, but I know in our, um, our discourse officer who's focusing on economic justice is creates a regular space um, for people who are engaged in, in issues of uh, around this discourse area. 
And she's really done a great job of reaching out to people who previously wouldn't necessarily want to be at this table together because they really didn't understand um, their work as overlapping in any way. But through the space, they've, they've sort of come to understand like where are their areas of overlap, where is their areas of unity. And I really think that as Baha'is, that's something that we're really trying to learn to do as we participate in this work. Thank you. So the next question we have, I think, is touching on this distinction with national discourses uh, versus discourses that different communities might be contributing to at a local level. So the question is, does your office support efforts or provide advice uh, for efforts at the local level? Our mayor has proclaimed his goal to eliminate racism in Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, what would be you know, a good approach for uh, benefiting from Baha'i inspired ideas? Yeah, I think that um, in our, one of the things that May and I think about is, is, is uh, that the national discourse on race unfolds at many levels. And it definitely is, there is a lot to learn about what is happening at the local level. In fact, um, some of the, the richest, most, interesting things is, is that's the case. So just to give an example, um, we uh, James May and I went to Detroit for about a week a few years ago. Um, and it was, it was a, I think it kind of is an example of, of how local and national come together. So we went to a national conference called Facing Race um, that brought together people from all over the country. And we were able to, you know, learn a lot, meet a lot of people. It was a very good, um, learning experience. Um, and I think we, I think we were, we presented, I can't remember, but, but anyway, so it was, you know, also an opportunity for us to share some ideas, but then um, we, we were also able to work and connect with, we use that time, you know, traveling to Detroit to connect with local organizations. So there's an organization called the Bog Center, um, which does a lot of organizing in East Detroit for the last, I don't know, 50 years. And we were able to meet with their staff and, and representatives. We met with a local university, Wayne State University. Um, we met with a program that does work. Uh, it's called, it's actually a Baha'i inspired program called M Rule, um, which is a multiracial university living experience. And so we met with um, a number of their alumni uh, who still lived in the Michigan area doing work locally to, to see how that experience and M Rule influenced their, their lives and their thinking. So I think, you know. It was it was actually quite useful for us to to be both at the at a national space, but then to be in a local space. Um, and I, I think um, the work that that mayor's offices are doing right now is is great because in some ways cities um, are not enmeshed in such political gridlock that we have at the at the at the national level. And so um, constructive approaches can be taken much more often, more easily and openly. Um, and, and so, so I think there's a lot of mayors, especially in the South that are doing, that are, are, are young and coming from a different perspective and are doing very interesting work. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's, that's a, a great question. Yeah, our, actually we, our office um, fields questions such as these from local spiritual assemblies um, around the country. So, I'm, I, to be honest, like we could have this conversation more in detail. So I could give you the email address, Baha'is uh, US at usbnc.org. <laughs> That's great. Actually, one of the questions was how to be in touch with your office following this presentation. So that's great. Maybe the, the email address can be posted um, visually so people can know how to reach you. Sure, definitely. Um, Maybe a final question as we're getting close to the end of the session is uh, about the, the power of media. And this question is, how can we stop the dividing force of cable internet media from further segmenting society? Well, I'm gonna assume that was directed at me, um, but I wish I had a, a great answer for you. It's a, it's a very complex and excellent question. And it's one with, which the national discourse on media is uh, very gravely concerned. 
You know, and I, I think I think for the the kind of change that you're you're alluding to in your question would really re require a complete systemic overhaul of our our media system, which is based on a number of uh, faulty premises. I would say that that contribute to the the phenomenon you identify of uh, division and segmentation, and uh, I think one is the sort of prevalence of conflict in all areas of public discourse, but particularly in our media, there's a sense that uh, the best ideas occur through contention. That's a premise that I think will require a significant overhaul. I also think there's an issue with something as vital as a media system being subject to the whims of market forces um, and being sort of needing to adhere to a, to a model that generates profit um, to the exclusion of other values. I think that's a, a very dangerous premise for public information to be based upon. And there's, there have been a number of conversations around this by a number of media scholars more, more erudite um, and, and more informed than, than I am. Finally, I think on an individual level, and I think this is, this is really important, is just to recognize that what's occurring, what, 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 we, what we're so often disturbed by in reviewing our social media feeds and in watching cable news, these things may have a sort of in, internal coherence and compulsion. But you know, if we if we get out in the neighborhood and and we're and we're kind of engaged in the in the framework of the plan and, and serving in our in our neighborhoods and communities, uh, this reality it's not consistent with with that one. You know, we find a different world in a certain sense, um, and that's a great comfort to me at least to to realize that. These uh, sort of these flashy, contentious images that are often put uh, before our eyes—they're almost like snow globes, you know—and that they do have a sort of internal consistency, and they they look very appealing in a certain sense. But it's not the real world, you know. Um, and that's a very short and and uh, incomplete answer to your excellent question. And uh, if you'd like, you can you can certainly follow up with with me by email after after the presentation is over. I'd be happy to take it up further with you. Thank you. And maybe just to say that um, just two pieces of, of guidance that seem particularly relevant to this question is the, the December 1st, 2019 message from the House of Justice about social media, and then also the message on climate change from November 27th, 29th, 2017. And, and those are all both posted on the Baha'i Reference Library. So friends, we're nearing the end of our session today. So I wanted to thank all of the panelists for their great insights and for answering all of these uh, tricky questions. And I'd also like to thank the, the audience, all the participants that tuned in this afternoon or evening, wherever you are, uh, to learn with us and to also think about what discourses you may be contributing to uh, in your neighborhood or your city. We have the stats that over 80 per 80 people participated in this session. And it is possible to re-watch um, this session later as everything is recorded or to tell your friends about it. Um, so I hope that you enjoyed this session and that you continue to enjoy this excellent conference. Thanks.